Golden twin towns refer to those pairs of cities, towns, and villages that are facing each other across the borders but belong to different countries. On my left is China, and one on my right is Myanmar. Maybe some of them used to be one town or village in the history, but were separated by the borders later. Maybe they were border towns of neighboring countries historically. They are both socialist country and have implemented uh, the reform and opening up policy. Anyway, the two sides have frequent interactions, even more than their interactions with the cities of their own countries. Different political, economic, and social actors collide and communicate here, and gradually integrate a unique culture, which is reflected in the landscape of architecture and space. <laughs> My name is Chang Liao, a PhD candidate in Kava. I shall discover the cultural landscape of the border twin towns and recognize their own cultural value. Let's start from the very beginning of the Chinese land border, Dongxing and Mongkai. Dongxing and Mongkai are bordered by Beilun River. Nowadays, the interactions across this border river may be more than ever before. By unfolding the history, we can find multiple layers of these two towns. The division by the borderline first gave the two sides differences in urban forms, but as time goes on, similarities have occurred because of regular communications. When did Dongxing and Mongkai have a border? We have to go back to the history before modern China. The French came to Vietnam in 1624. They wanted to control the country through religion, though Vietnam was a vassal state of Imperial China. Only until 1862 did France establish the French colony of Cochin China in the southern third of current Vietnam, which was also known as the French Indochina. Later, they planned to control the southwestern China through Tonkin, northern third of current Vietnam. They made series of invasions on the frontier. The Sino-French War eventually ended in 1885, when the Imperial China and France signed the Treaty of Tianjin. The high contracting parties agreed to delineate the border between China and Tonkin. Beilun River has been the border river of Dongxing and Mangkai since then. So we're now in Zhushan village in Dongxing city. Behind me is the boundary tablet number one of the Qing dynasty. This tablet was erected in uh, 80, 90. There are eight boundary tablets of Qing Dynasty in Dongxing. In 1886, one year after the Sino-French War, some rich businessmen came to Dongxing and started to construct the town. It became the original layout of the port, and the urban pattern still exists today. Jiefeng Road, one of the oldest streets in Dongxing city, with all the historic buildings along two sides. These buildings are not very Chinese style, instead they are pretty much French colonial style. They were built in the early 20th century. These buildings are normally two to three floors, with the first floor opening up for the stores, and the residents live on the second and third floor. The layout remains today. The villas of the earliest rich businessmen and governors would still be found in town. In 1898, to make it more convenient to pass the border, China and France agreed to build a bridge, known as the International Iron Bridge. It was designed by a French engineer. France was responsible for technique and steel supply, and China was responsible for labor force. Dongxing soon attracted lots of people. The small town consists of huge amounts of storefronts. The buildings clustered at the end of the bridge and were very close to the waterfront though the town area was set back by a green belt in Mongkai. Mongkai seems to be composed of French villas, churches, small industries, and military camps, different from the business atmosphere across the border river. The historic images of the 1950s shows the first border gate of Dongxing was built at the end of the bridge. The bridge and the twin towns were bombed to ruins during the sino vietnamese War in 1979, in 1992, when the relations of China and Vietnam were normalized, Dongxing was opened up again and started rapid construction. Urban expanded dramatically. 
Meng Kai started to rebuild four years later. Both the constructions were based on the planning and building forms of their countries without many similarities. The public buildings and residences in Meng Kai are similar to the forms in Ho Chi Minh City, like this market, and local residences. They are much different from what was like in the early 20th century. Dongxin started to build residential districts. The buildings are often from five to seven floors, and in the so-called new Chinese style or European style, which were popular all over China at the time. The rapid urban expansion continues, both spatially and economically, so that a new border bridge is built recently on the periphery of the towns. So I'm walking along the new expressway that links Dongxin City to Fangcheng Gang. We can see the second Beilin River Bridge. The bridge will open once the new border gates are completed. This new bridge will solve the problem of overburden of the original one and serve the new district in the future. Notably, some buildings representing the national power emerge along Beirun River. The buildings from one side mirror the building from the other side. For example, the Border Gate, Grand Hotel, and Border Shopping Mall. Moreover, there is a new Border Gate scenic spot in Dongxin. The elevations of the residences are painted into bright colors in order to create the ambience of a typical Vietnamese city. I also recognize a kind of informal space in Mang Kai, the store bank. It serves the people in both Mang Kai and Dongxin. It helps residents and traders to transfer currency easily, though it brings issues in currency control. In the case of Dongxin and Mang Kai, we can learn that at the beginning, the two towns were built by different forces. Dongxin was constructed by businessmen as a trade hub. Mang Kai was planned by French as colony, though nowadays in the places along borders where happen the most frequent interactions. To emphasize national identity of border culture, architecture and space tend to converge, just like the mirrored architecture and the street that uses Vietnamese cultural symbols. On the other hand, some modest informal wisdoms become the joints that connect the twin towns, like the store bank, these buildings appear because local traditions are highly programmed, therefore become culture, and the culture leaves its traces on space, 